Well, once again, I want your Bibles open, please, to Isaiah chapter 53, and we are going to finish our thoughts tonight on this man of sorrow that's revealed in this particular passage. For you parents who are in pew packers, or your kids are in pew packers, you, there's no need to thank me for the noisemakers that I gave to your children. I hope they have fun and that you enjoy it just as much as they do. I told them this morning I had a surprise for them, and they got all excited, so now they have them, and I'm sure you're just, just as excited. I enjoy that, pew packers and those kids, seeing them answer questions and uh, excited to learn. That's, that's something that's good. The man of sorrows. There are so many things in this particular chapter that should cause us to reflect on ourselves. You know, I, asked, I started off this morning asking the question, why are we here? Because I think sometimes we can lose sight of that. Sometimes we can get in the box checking mentality of just, I showed up at church, I sang, I prayed, I gave, I took the Lord's Supper, and I heard a sermon, and therefore I'm a good, faithful Christian. Well, there's no question that that is a part of what the good and faithful Christian does, but that is not the sum total of our Christianity. Just look at the things that are listed here as you're in Isaiah 53 talking about Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised. He bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. We thought that he was smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. The King James says he was bruised. Uh, more modern English versions say that he was crushed for our iniquities. You think about what they did to his body and the physical condition that he was in when they nailed him to the cross. Before he died, before he was put up there, he was just brutally beaten and abused. But he didn't open his mouth where we start tonight. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. Okay, so he's a, he is oppressed and afflicted according to verse 7. Five illegal trials. I mentioned this morning the prayer in Gethsemane. He told his disciples, stay here while I go yonder and pray. He went about a stone's throw from them. They couldn't stay awake. And he was in agony and in tears. Hebrews 5 and verse 7 says that he was in vehement cries and tears. And he was heard because of his godly fear. That's just the beginning of his sorrows. Judas, his own friend, betrays him. He's taken by a mob and beaten spit on, humiliated, for hours on end, all through the night. He goes through five illegal trials. He goes to see Annas and Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin. He's sent then to Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod. Herod can't get anything out of him, and so Herod sends him back to Pilate. He was oppressed and afflicted. And again, you notice this text as you're reading Isaiah chapter 53 that we know Isaiah is writing approximately 700 years before even the birth of Christ, let alone what he goes through 30 years later or so. But it's so certain to happen that he's spoken, that it's spoken as if it's already accomplished here in Isaiah chapter 53. Yet he remained silent. Again, look at that in verse 7. He was led, the text says, or brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb or silent, a more modern English word, so he opened not his mouth. So I told you this morning, I watched some videos on shepherds and the test that they would put on their sheep. They would only come to the shepherds. I then watched some other videos uh, on sheep shearing, and it's amazing what, how that process is done. I saw some with modern tools, and I saw some with, uh, what would you call them, primitive instruments, shears, and they would rock that sheep back on its, on its dock, and they just start trimming away, and the sheep would never make a sound. And we're told that's what happened with Jesus. I want you to take your Bibles real quick to Mark chapter 15, and I want you to look at this with me. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. We know that he spoke some, didn't he? He spoke to Pilate uh, when Pilate would ask him questions, but that's the thing. He would speak when he was asked a specific question. Are you a king? What is the truth? Things like this. But when the accusations came against Jesus, he wouldn't say a word. And, and that's the point to me. What was he going to say? What could he have said that would have stopped what they were doing? There's nothing that he could have said that could have convinced Caiaphas or the Sanhedrin 
or Pilate. Well, maybe not Pilate. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Herod, the only thing Herod wanted to see was a miracle or two. He just wanted to show. What could he have possibly said that would have stopped what was going on? Why would he say that anyway? Because he knew why he came to this earth. Anyway, look at Mark chapter 15. And straightway in the morning, chief priests, uh, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. So he asked him a question. Are you the king of the Jews? You've said it. So he doesn't not say anything whatsoever. He doesn't answer the accusation, the, the false accusations. The chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Pilate asked him again, saying, aren't you going to say anything? Don't you think Pilate, being in the position he is in, and having seen other cases and accusations, don't you think he has seen defendants try to defend themselves? Say something? Aren't you going to say anything? But he answered nothing. L listen to how many things they're witnessing against you. But Jesus answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. He could not believe the silence that Jesus maintained during this trial. He remained silent. Look at Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. The New King James says he was taken from prison and from judgment. Some versions say he was taken from prison and from justice. There was no justice given to Jesus. There's an old book. I used to have it. I don't have it anymore, and I can't remember. It was written by a lawyer, but he, it's called The Trial of Jesus, and it documents everything historically that he went through and how everything that was done to Jesus in the arrest and the trials, everything was against law, whether Jewish law or Roman. Everything was done illegally against Christ. He was taken from prison and from justice. And who will declare his generation? So, again, he receives no justice. Not one person stood by his side. I mentioned this morning Peter. Peter followed him at a distance, didn't he? Peter stays out in the courtyard, and that's where he gets in trouble because he denies Christ three times. Nobody, not one person stood by his side, even though everybody knew he was innocent. Everybody knew he was innocent. Everybody knew the miracles. Everybody knew the teaching that he has been doing for, for three years. Pilate, we're told, in fact, in Matthew 27, I think it's, I can't remember what verse it is, but... Pilate knew that for envy they delivered him. It wasn't for some criminal violation. It was because they hated him. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. His death took him from the injustices that he was suffering. Death, in essence, in that one sense, was a relief. Imagine being dragged to court under false accusations Nobody will listen to you. You've been beaten. What? You know what the ultimate end is going to be, so, well, why not? Let's just go ahead and end this now. You know, there are some things that are worse than death. And so he was released from all these things, from all these injustices, when he died. That's something to think about, isn't it? And again, he did this willingly. Three times in John's account, John 18, 36, 19, 4, in 196, Pilate says, I find no fault in him. Pilate was willing to just be, give him a beating, a scourging, and let him go. But the crowds wouldn't have it. Verse 9. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death because he has done, he had done no violence, nor was any defeat, uh, deceit found in his mouth. Again, completely innocent betrayed by his friends, everything done from the legal perspective was against the law. And yet, not only that, he died as a common criminal. When you look at the text, he died with, he's surrounded by, the, the King James says, malefactors, criminals. Those guys were there just, and they even acknowledge, acknowledge that, don't they? You remember when everybody is mocking Christ and wagging their heads at him, one of the thieves is, well, both of the thieves are doing the same, aren't they? But the one who, to whom Jesus says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, he's finally, I guess you could say he wised up and said to the other thief, don't you fear God? We're here justly. We deserve exactly what we're getting. This man has done nothing wrong. That's Luke's record of it in Luke chapter 23. 
Looking back up in verse 8, tying it with this idea, okay, so he dies with and as a common criminal. He's taken from prison and justice. Who's going to declare his generation? It was a custom to release a prisoner, wasn't it? And you know who was released, Barabbas. And the text tells us that the people knew that Barabbas was involved in insurrection and he was a murderer. So think about that, okay? His, not only have his own acquaintances, his own friends have fled. They've deserted him. One of them betrayed him. One denies him. The beatings again, the five trials that last all night long. But then there's an opportunity at the hands of everybody to let him go. It's a custom that we can let one man go. Who's it going to be? And the crowd starts chanting for Barabbas, who's again known for insurrection and murder. And that's the one that... Imagine that, those, that being your choice. Someone like Jesus Christ, there is no one else like Jesus Christ, but a completely innocent person versus a known murderer. And you choose a murderer because you hate this other guy so much. He's revealed you for what you are. And that's really what's happened with the Sanhedrin, with Pilate and with Herod. Jesus has revealed them for exactly what they are. And they hate him so much that they're willing to let a murderer go free in his place. He died with and as a common criminal. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. His, he was buried in the tomb, as you know. John 19 tells us the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, one of his disciples, they prepared his body and, and they buried him in an honorable way after a dishonorable death. See, cru the, the purpose of crucifixion was not just death. I mean, ultimately, yeah, that's, that's it. But crucifixion was a deterrent. Imagine entering a city and you see all these crosses on the outskirts of the city and bodies hanging on them. You might think twice, well, number one, you might think twice about moving there, but you might think twice before you try to do anything illegal. Because these are the consequences. You see the bodies all around you. And that's what it was like. And so, <clears throat> he has this dishonorable death as a common criminal, but he's given an honorable burial. Look at the first part of verse 53. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Think about that statement. How in the world could you say that? So there's this idea, and I want to... I want to talk about this just a little bit because there are so many bad ideas about this. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. But how many of you heard that, that when it went dark, that's when God turned his back on Jesus? Absolutely false. It is absolutely false that that happened. It pleased the Lord, the text says, to bruise him. Why is that the case? It's not that he was bruised. It's that God's will was being accomplished. He was determined by the... Uh, he, he was crucified, put to death by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, according to Acts 2 and verse 23. This is God's scheme of redemption. This is the offering of a sacrifice that, that supersedes every other sacrifice that's ever been offered. It's the only sacrifice that can take away sin and guilt. The Father's pleasure was not in the horrific death. It was in the results of His shedding His blood, of His willingly shedding His blood. That's why it pleased the Father. Three things are accomplished in his death. Look at verse 10. Three things at the end of this. He shall see his seed. You and I, if you have put Christ on in baptism, if, you'd obey, if you have obeyed the gospel, you are the seed of Christ. We've talked about this a lot lately in Genesis, haven't we? The seed of Abraham, ultimately. There's number one. Many people are going to be brought to, Christ, brought to God through Jesus Christ. He's going to see his seed. He shall prolong his days, verse 10 says then. What happened to Christ three days after his death and his burial? It's his resurrection and it's his ascension 40 days later. His life is going to be prolonged. Well, Christ is in eternity. He's called in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I, I find this so interesting. It's a physical resurrection. Remember what he told Thomas? Here are my hands. Here's my side. You see everything. Jesus didn't turn into a spirit and float away as a spirit. The Bible tells me in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He went to the Father. He shall prolong his days. And then thirdly, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
I think, when, when I think of that phrase, or when I read that phrase in verse 10, I think of Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The best way to translate that is, my death will not prevent it from happening. And that's the end of Isaiah 53, 10. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. Wasn't it the blood of Jesus that bought the church? Isn't it the blood of Jesus that buys every soul today, that purchases every soul who obeys the gospel? You have those three results at the end of Isaiah 53 and verse 10 from it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Again, this is God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge that it happened this way. Look at verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul. So here's where I want to kind of focus in more on that idea of Jesus, uh, rather God did not forsake the Son on the cross. So what people often do is, well, Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he did say that, didn't he? But the question is not, did he say it? It's why? Well, it's a quote from Psalm chapter 22. David starts it off that way. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David, and as you read that psalm, as it progresses through, because of what's going on in his life, he felt forsaken. But when you get to the end of that psalm, he says, you have not forsaken me. Jesus is quoting Scripture here, and on the cross, while He's dying, to prove a point, He is not forsaken. God did not turn His back on Jesus. because And think about it this way. If He did, He's turning His back on His own plan. He's turning His back on His own Son. I don't know how a person could believe that, but look at verse 11 again. He shall see the travail of His soul. The, King James, the New King James says he shall see the labor. He's going to see what he endures on the cross. And look at this, the next four words, and shall be satisfied. Again, the death of Jesus on the cross satisfied the justice of God. The wages of sin is death. I mentioned the text this morning, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Jesus didn't become a sinner on the cross he took, on, uh, he took on Himself what we deserved for our sin. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 is about, and that's what Isaiah chapter 53 is about. Righteousness and justification is through knowledge. Look at verse 11 again. By His knowledge shall many be made righteous. Shall He justify many, for He shall bear their iniquities. The only way you can be made right with God, you're not born into Christianity. You were born into Judaism, weren't you? That's why you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. That's why you had to be dedicated in the temple, things like this. And, and you see that with Jesus in, in Luke chapter 2. But you have to be born again to become a Christian. You have to come to a knowledge of the truth. And that's what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Righteousness and justification is through the knowledge of not just the life and teachings of Christ, but His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Now look at verse 12. Therefore, will I divide, a, divide him with a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. The spo that's, that's war language in the Old Testament, isn't it? Dividing the spoil. There's a victor here, and it's Jesus. I mean, throughout the entire chapter, he's despised, rejected, he's murdered, forsaken. But now, he's victorious. He would be rewarded for his obedient death and his total completion of God's will. What was one of the last sayings of the... Uh, la one of the last seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. He did everything God sent Him to do. I think of John chapter 9 and verse 4. I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day, because the night is coming when no man can work. He understood that He had a limited amount of time. Well, He's going to accomplish God's will, and the spoil is going to be divided. He's going to be rewarded. Why? Because He has poured out His soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, that's reiterated, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what he did on the cross. He did what you and I could not do. Think about that last phrase there, and made intercession for the transgressors. I think there's a, a connection that you can make with what Moses did as it's recorded in Exodus 32. As he's up on the mountain, Aaron and the Israelites make this golden calf, he comes down and, and essentially God says, I'm going to wipe them out and start over with you. What does Moses do? He intercedes. Now some people died on that day, and rightfully so, but Moses interceded, interceded for them and saved the nation. In fact, one of the things he said is, if you can blot my name out of the book of life, blot my name out, but save these people, essentially. 
Jesus died for us. He made intercession for us. We are the transgressors. And we didn't deserve anything that He did for us. Here's where I want us to close tonight. Take your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we will start in verse 5. The man of sorrows. We've covered a lot of ground, I know, in this text, but in, in the chapter, Isaiah 53, but let's finish with this. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You have to ask yourself, why does he say that? Well, because if you read the first four verses, he's warning the church in Philippi of strife and vainglory. Okay, selfish conceit, being egocentric, you know, I, it's all about me. No. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what better way to illustrate that than like this? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man. Hebrews says it like this. He took part of the same with us. He took on flesh and blood. He didn't take on the nature of angels. He had to become like us. So being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that's kind of emphatic right there. He didn't just die. It's even the death of the cross and what he went through there. And then verses 9 through 11 here in Philippians 2, this is what Isaiah 53 and verse 12 is all about. Listen to it. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus obeyed God completely to the complete final fulfillment of God's plan, and he was rewarded. So that Philippians 2 text starts out with, you need to have the same mind that Jesus had. Well, what kind of a mind is that? Obedient. John's gospel really puts this emphasis throughout. I don't know how many times John's gospel says it, but it says something along the lines of, or Jesus says, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What are we 